Hello everybody and welcome to Dungeons and Drams. Tonight we're going to be doing another ChatGPT AI tutorial here where we're going to be doing something that you might not think is all that exciting, but I promise you that it will be. So we're going to be thinking about plants. Everything from just what kind of plants are in your world to what kind of plants are going to eat your players. <laughs> so let's get into a prompt. You know what we're starting with. I am a dungeon master playing Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. I would like some help coming up with some fantasy plants that will be found in my world. Now here's your initial prompt. I define a plant to have the following characteristics. A description including unusual features, if any, because they should be magical. You're in a fantasy world. You don't want, like, a blade of grass. I mean, you do, but that's boring. <laughs> Uses, if any. Can it be eaten? Can it be used for poisons? How would you harvest it? Can I sell it? Does it have any defense mechanisms? How does it reproduce? Does it have any magical properties? And then I want to say, do you understand? Because I don't necessarily want it to spit any out yet. I have more stuff I want to prompt it with. And of course it did anyway, but that's okay. Let's check out a couple of the ones it gave us and then we'll give it some more prompts. So first off is the Shadow Thorn Rose. It's a black rose that seems to absorb light around it. The edges of its petals shimmer with a faint violet hue. Okay, that sounds pretty cool. Sounds kind of like a black lotus, like the magic card. Uh, uses shadow thorn petals can be used to make a dye that is coveted by thieves and spies for its ability to darken clothing to near invisibility in shadows. That's pretty cool. Uh, it's <laughs> not recommended that you eat it. Eating the rose induces hallucinations of one's greatest fears. Uh, that could be used for some torture scenes, though. Uh, poison, yes, ground petals can be used as a psychological torment poison. <laughs> Perfect. Um, can you harvest it, or how do you harvest it? To harvest without injury, one must wear gloves woven with moonlit silk. Okay. Uh, can you sell it? Yes, but selling is illegal in many kingdoms due to its dangerous properties. That makes sense. Defense mechanism. When touched by direct sunlight, it releases a thick black smoke that can suffocate intruders. Now, you got to wonder how that kind of works in nature right so it's it seems to absorb light around it but when touched by direct sunlight so i guess maybe there's like maybe you can only harvest the stuff at night and during the day there's just like a, a grove that's a plume of smoke that's actually that's pretty cool um makes it very easy to know where it is though Reproduction. Uh, by moonlight, it releases spores that find shadows to grow in. That's cool. Magical properties. When burned, the smoke can be used to communicate with the shadow plane. That's interesting. So overall, I actually really like the shadow thorn rose. And this is exactly what I'm thinking of, at least for plants. We're going to go into like plant monsters in a little bit too. All right. Next is the Celestial Clover. It's a four-leaf clover that glows with a soft golden light, often used in religious ceremonies, symbolizing luck and divine favor. I kind of like this. It's a little less magical, but it's, like, important to the world. Um, is it... You can it be eaten? Yes, when eaten, it provides a sense of calm and clarity. Uh, it's not a poison. You can harvest it by... Uh, must be done during dawn or dusk to preserve its radiant properties. Uh, you can sell, absolutely, especially to temples and clerics. Defense mechanism attracts celestial creatures when threatened. Holy crap. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe it's a little bit more dangerous. Reproduction. Reproduces on nights when meteor showers are visible. Okay. That's interesting. Magical properties grants minor visions of or dreams of potential futures. Okay. So we can just kind of keep going on this, but I'm not going to because this is what I care more about. I am a DM. I've got my world in front of me and I'm world building and I'm looking at different biomes that I have going on and I just want to put some of these things there. So let's tell it to make some for various biomes in the world. Now you could spend time here, you could say give me 10 for tundra, um, but in this case I'm just going to say give it, give me like three for various biomes. So let's do that. So I say can you give me three examples for each of these biomes? Grassland, swamp, ocean, mountain, forest, desert, tundra, and dungeon. Um, obviously dungeons are going to be a little bit based off where you are and where that dungeon is, but let's just see what it comes up with. And I'll kind of go through these as it's generating. So for the grassland, I'm not going to read them all because it'd be like a million of them, but for grassland, let's just see. Whispering wheat. Tall golden wheat that hums softly in the wind. Cool. Woven into garments to communicate over long distances. Interesting. Eaten. Yes, you can make bread from it to convey messages when eaten. That's kind of interesting. So you send a message as a loaf of bread, which is strange, but does definitely feel magical and maybe gets through some sort of uh you know lines of defense soldiers aren't necessarily gonna look at this and be like is this bread talking bread <laughs> uh it's not poisonous 
you harvest it with a song or chant. That's interesting. So I, I could see some world building here where you have farmers who have to harvest this, and they're a bunch of singers, and why are they singers? Like, what do they sing? You could make up some songs, or you could ask ChatGPT to make it up. Um, you could sell, yes, especially to bards. Uh, defense mechanism, intense humming can deafen intruders. Okay. Reproduction spreads with wind songs. This feels a little bit stretched at this point. Magical properties carries sound-based spells further. Okay, I mean, I would take that personally. I would probably reduce it. I would just say, oh yeah, here they grow whispering wheat. As you walk through this field, you hear this gentle hum, and you see some farmers off to the side who are singing songs as you watch the, the wheat kind of levitate out of the ground, and then they harvest it through the air. You know, it floats or whatever. And, you know, you learn that you can make bread out of this that is used to communicate with you know, secret messages or something like that. And maybe growing it is a little bit, uh, elite, or maybe not illegal, but like you shouldn't because it's kind of got bad implications of secret uh, secrecy. Yes. Um, so <laughs> next we have the glotus flower. Blooms only at night with radiant petals, uh, grounded to luminous paint. Yes, grants night vision temporarily. Um, you sell it. It blinds predators with a flash of light as its defense. Um, it's reproduced by moths, and it enhances illusion magic. Now, you can decide as the DM how that works. And there's another for stride gra grass, but let's go to swamp. Uh, referencing mystic mangrove from the previous list as one. Okay, so that was the one I didn't read, of course, but that's fine. Let's go to fenfire frond. Ferns that produce eerie blue flames. Cool. Uses natural lighting. Uh, lanterns. You know, as a DM, whenever I'm making places, lighting is always something that I'm thinking of. And I'll tell you, sometimes, like, if you're just walking around, you got the moonlight, sure, but you want more light sometimes. This is a cool concept. If I'm in a swamp, I don't want to just be like, oh, you see a weird glow over there. And then they're like, well, crap, that's going to be like a, a enemy. I'm like, no, it's a fern fire front. It's just, it's just there. They're, they're kind of all over the place and they're produ producing this natural light. Um, I like that a lot. All right, so uh, they can't be eaten. They are poison. Um, the smoke induces paranoia. Oh, good. You know, there's a lot of dangerous stuff in nature. Uh, douse flames with blessed water. Um, okay, so in order to harvest it, you have to douse the flames with blessed water. Uh, you could sell it to alchemists. It sets aggressive creatures aflame. <laughs> um, okay, so don't don't try to hack at this stuff. But you know, if you're you're uh, chaotic. Uh, chaotic neutral or whatever chaotic good uh guy is just whacking at stuff and because they like to make a mess maybe make them pay <laughs> they spread fiery uh via fiery spores and their magical properties they can rekindle extinguished magical flames okay that's pretty cool um and then there's you know a couple more of them let's see what it comes up with the ocean here you have the abyssal anemone that's cool uh deep sea anem anemone <laughs> Anemone. Yes, I'm saying it right. That's one of those words that you always think you're saying wrong. Uh, that lures with bioluminescent lights. I actually had something very similar to this in the campaign that I'm currently running on this channel. Um, I won't say much more about it, but very similar, actually. Natural lanterns in abyssal conditions. Um, eaten. No, it's too gelatinous. Ugh. Uh, it's poisonous. Yes, tentacles induce par paralysis. You can harvest it with protective gloves during their dormant phase. You could sell it to deep sea divers. And, oh, I guess because it pro provides uh, light in abyssal conditions. That's cool. So they're thinking abyssal as in very, very deep, not the abyss. Um, then you have defensive mechanisms, obviously paralyzing tentacle strike. Reproduction releases glowing spores and magical properties enhances dark vision spells. Okay, that's cool. Um, I do want to read one more just because I like ocean stuff. So tide collar tangleweed. You got seaweed that sings with the tide, uh, predicting tidal events. Yes, it sharpens hearing temporarily. Uh, I mean, this one's okay. The I think the main point I'm trying to get here is it's very easy to use this to help world build, and plants are something that not everybody thinks of, or at least you don't think of it kind of early on. But if you're thinking about the way that, let's say those those uh, fern fronds, right? Those were, was that what it was called? No, fire frond? Fen fire frond. I like those the most so far of all the ones I've read here because they have the most use. And... You just should think about stuff like that. What is growing here and what are the people who live here? How would they utilize the natural resources around them? There's all kinds of plants here and a lot of them do stuff. Maybe some places they harvest uh, these ones that you could sell to alchemists and they have like a trade route and now you've got a trade route to a city and a reason to go there and all these things. Plants are important. They don't seem it, but they're important. All right, let's talk about something a little bit more interesting and that's plant monsters. 
The while it finished generating all of those plants that I asked it to, I went and wrote this. I would like to consider some dangerous sentient plants. These should be a cross between plants and monsters. I will refer to these as, and this is a new technique I'm going to teach you here, although it's pretty, uh, I think it's pretty intuitive. Um, putting things in quotes gives them a name. You're naming a variable, essentially. I say, I will refer to these as plant monsters. So in this case, now I can call it a plant monster. I consider a creature to have the following information. This is my creature template, which you could find down in the description if you want. This is the same thing you've seen countless times at this point. And then I say, could you create me a plant monster that would live in the desert? Because I wanted to give it a challenge. You know, because when I think plants, I think desert. <laughs> now it says, absolutely, here's a plant monster tailored for a desert environment. I have no idea what this is. I haven't read this yet. All right, name is the Sandthorn Strangler. Sounds like uh, the Scranton Strangler, <laughs> right? Uh, concept and theme, a carnivorous desert plant that uses mirages and illusions to lure prey. Physical description, the Sandthorn sand thorn Strangler is a tall cactus-like plant, there's a shock, uh, with serrated vines hidden beneath the sand. I do like that. Its central body stands about six feet tall with vibrant purple flowers and thorny exterior. The base of the plant is surrounded by a mound of shifting sand. Okay, so I'm picturing a cactus six foot tall cactus there's these vines underneath the ground that if you get too close now you're already in trouble and the sand around this thing can shift so now you're gonna get stuck in the sand and just whacked with these vines again i haven't read this that's what i picture let's see if that's actually what it is uh rolling challenge it's an ambusher and controller challenge rating five okay Descriptive text. As you traverse the dunes, a sudden fragrance of sweet nectar fills the air. I love these descriptive texts. In the distance, a majestic cactus stands out among the desert landscape, its vibrant purple flowers inviting and out of place. But as you approach, the sand around it seems to shift, and the very ground itself threatens to entangle and consume. Okay, cool. So it's got some weaknesses, resistance, etc. Lauren flavor. Ancient desert tribes tell tales of wandering travelers who, in their thirst and desperation, which is definitely the situation you should put your players into, are seduced by the Sandthorn's illusion. They are never seen again. The Strangler is said to be the desert's way of protecting its secrets. That's an interesting uh, little um, thought, right? So reward, reward is Sandthorn Nectar, which ingested grants resistance to fire damage for one hour. That's I, I feel like you could fiddle with that. Like, certainly just give them some water, <laughs> you know? Uh, Role-playing opportunities. A desert druid or shaman may seek the party's help in relocating uh, the strangler away from his sacred site. That makes sense. A uh, merchant might offer a bounty for sandthorn nectar. Both of those make a lot of sense. Um, now, I have this as a standard, but I like that it didn't just make it talk uh i like that it gave it telepathy now too so five things the creature might say um you know come closer weary traveler rest here like these things speaking in your mind first off if a cactus starts speaking to me i feel like i might not go near that cactus but i've also played D, &D as a dm and i know that my players are gonna go near that cactus <laughs> The desert is vast, but here find solace. Like, if you did the right voice in their head, they might take that as an invite rather than a threat. So you could you could make that happen. Um, it's got a stat block. Uh, it's very strong. Um, it's got wisdom, which is interesting, but I suppose the telepathy maybe. Um, it has a lot of charisma, maybe because it looks like a big thing of water in the middle of the desert, I guess. I'm not sure. Uh, but its abilities, it can once per day create an illusion of a water source or oasis to lure prey. It has serrated vines. Okay, so there you go. Um, Deserts Embrace, a creature grappled by the Sandthorn Strangler, takes an additional 2d6 necrotic damage at the start of each of its turns. So I envision that as the cactus sucking water from their body. Um, I like that. Rooted Defense, the Sandthorn Strangler has advantage on saving throws against being knocked prone or moved against its will. And uh, adventurers should be around 4 to 6 levels, uh, level 6, 4 to 6 before fighting it. Um, so... I want to do one more, but at the risk of making this just another monster episode, let's let's do one more. But let's give it kind of a, a little bit of a twist. So let's just try this. I want I have a creature in mind um, that I've used before. It's called a moss dog. Basically, it's a dog or like a wolf made out of moss. It's kind of like a low level. I want to say it was a CR2. Um, almost killed my players a couple of times. Uh, but let's try this. I want you to create another plant monster that can move around quickly. Focus on the what drawbacks it would have by being a plant. How does it feed itself? How does it gather water? Why does it attack travelers? So I thought this was a nice little twist of plants don't move. Even like a shambler um, moves, but not very fast. So I wanted to say specifically it moves fast. Let's see what it comes up with. 
So it created the Verdant Vanguard, and it reminds me a lot of a Blight. However, I, I like this one, and after reading through it, it does sound kind of terrifying to run into, especially if you did a couple of these that are, like, hunting you, right? So, among the lush greenery, you spot a tall humanoid shape springing between the trees. Vines coil and uncoil rapidly, propelling it forward. Bright petals surrounding a gaping maw on its torso, which opens hungrily as it draws nearer. So that's interesting. It's kind of giving this impression of just these things leaping through the trees and hunting down on the forest floor. So it is uh, seven foot tall. Verdant Vanguard resembles a humanoid figure made of tightly woven uh, wound vines, thorns, and moss. Instead of legs, it has coiled tendrils that allow it to spring forward rapidly. It has a central maw-like orifice surrounded by bright luminescent petals. Okay, um, so it evolved locomotion to chase down its prey primarily for water and minerals. Now I liked this piece. Um, I, well, so it's vulnerable to fire damage. I asked it to focus on that kind of stuff. That makes perfect sense. It requires water regularly, getting disadvantage on all rolls if it doesn't hydrate within a day. So you could factor that in a little bit. Um, but here's what I liked. Scrolling down a bit, where I told it to focus on the drawbacks of being a plant. Dependency on water makes it sometimes reckless in its pursuit. Okay, fine. That That's whatever. It's photosynthetic, meaning it's less active during nighttime and prefers bright sunlight or energy okay that makes sense here's the cool part feeding mechanism primarily feeds by attaching to creatures and draining their fluids this thing's seven feet tall <laughs> it can absorb water from sources but prefers live hydration due to the minerals found in bodily fluids love that um and it attacks travelers because they're mobile water sources the more the vanguard's dehydrated the more aggressive it becomes in its pursuit cool all right, so some of its abilities, uh, it can basically move um, 20 feet. If it goes 20 feet straight towards a target, then it hits it with a vine attack. On the same turn, the target takes an additional damage. Uh, vine whip, right, you're hitting it, fine. Hydrate. The Vanguard attaches itself to a grappled creature, draining it for 2d6 necrotic damage and healing itself for the same amount. Okay. <laughs> this thing has 90 hit points. So if it latches onto somebody, it might take a, a hit or two if it thinks that that creature is like close to death. I, I kind of like that. Desperate hydration. If the Vanguard hasn't had water source in a day, it gets an extra attack, but all attacks are at disadvantage. Cool. So overall, I mean, probably not like my favorite character uh, creature that we've created here, but you could see how it's cool to take a plant and make it into a monster. Um, I've done it multiple times and it's my players are generally afraid of moss. <laughs> like they won't go near it anymore, which is probably smart. Uh, but in this case, these are plants. Plants are important. Thanks for watching this episode. But one thing I want you guys to do is, in the chat, let me know what you create. I get a lot of compliments in the chat, and they're awesome. Thank you guys so much for all of that. It's, like, really, really motivating. But what I don't ever see is the cool stuff that you all make. Some of you have joined the Discord and told me about it a little bit, but let me know in the comments. That helps the video grow, etc. But generally, like, there's so many brains here, and you guys are probably really good world builders if you're watching a video like this. Tell me what you create. I bet you can create way cooler stuff than I can. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me here. I think next week we're going to make a tavern, and we're going to probably make it a bit of a longer video because I actually want to take the time, flesh out a full tavern, all the things, and show you how we can not just take the little pieces that I've been teaching you about, but instead do all the stuff. All right, so catch me here next week. Talk to you later. Cheers.